All right, we're going to do the second practice problem for homework number five, which involves, let's restate the problem. It involves a plate, I believe, of steel that is being annealed. So it's being reheated. And it's, we're going to make a 1D assumption here. So there's only heat transfer in one direction. Here's the center line. All right, so this is steel. So let's state some of our properties. We have 7,830 kilograms per meters cubed, a heat capacity of 550 joules per kilogram Kelvin. Uh, make sure this is in joules since we work in watts and heat transfer joules is the equivalent, not kilojoules. Our thermal conductivity is going to be 48 watts per meter Kelvin. Okay, now this um, piece of steel, the slab, starts at an initial temperature of 200 degrees Celsius. What happens is we put it in an oven with convection, ooh, I drew this wrong, on both sides, so the top and the bottom, where T infinity, so our oven temperature, is equal to 800 degrees Celsius. And then our convection heat transfer coefficient is a very large 250 watts per meter squared Kelvin. All right, so these are all of our properties for our problem. Again, we have a 1D slab that is being heated on both sides. So the temperature of our slab will be increasing since T infinity is larger than our initial temperature. Okay, um, before we move on, we're going to compute alpha, the thermal diffusivity, which is equal to K divided by rho C. So using these three things, this is a property associated with our material that involves how effectively heat diffuses through the material versus being absorbed and raising the temperature of the material. Okay, uh, so that when we plug in our numbers, we get a value of 1.115 times 10 to the negative fifth. All right, uh, finally, at the very bottom here, we're going to state what it is that we're trying to do in this problem. We want to find the time to get to a temperature of 550 degrees Celsius. Uh, now, related to this, we want to find the time until the entire material is at least at this temperature. In other words, our minimum temperature in the material will be at 550 degrees Celsius. OK, remembering that we are heating, so the surface will be hotter than the inside, and we're heating from both sides. That means that the temperature of our center line will be the coldest part. So we're going to find the temperature of our center line, figure out how long it takes to get to a temperature of 550 degrees C. So let's draw our energy balance slash control volume. OK, now for this problem, I'm going to draw this control volume. And that will be clear why in a second. I'm also going to draw a different control volume, which is this control volume. So these two control volumes um, speak to the two different approaches that we're going to try. So let's discuss approach. OK, so the first thing we do, this is a transient problem. We always check the BO number to see if it's isothermal. So we're going to check the BO number of our problem. If it's isothermal, we're going to use this top control volume and treat the entire thing as one lumped temperature. But if not, we will use solved 1D equation. So if instead we can't use a lumped um, capacitance approach, then we're going to use this small differential control volume representing the heat diffusion equation. In other words, d squared t dx squared equals 1 over alpha, that's why we needed this value, times dt dt. And we will use the solution to this equation in order to find our minimum temperature. OK, so we know our approach. Let's go ahead and do it. The first thing we will do is check our BO number. So our BO number is always equal to H 
times the characteristic length over k. Remember, this assumes that we only have convection heat transfer leaving our surface. If we also have radiation, this BO number would need to account for a total heat loss coefficient, not just a convection heat loss coefficient. So let's plug those in. We have an H of 250, and now the hardest part, what is our characteristic length? For a plain wall with cooling on both sides, or heating in this case, then actually our center line temperature acts like an insulated surface. If that's the case, we only use half of the length, um, which I forgot to state, but that would be, so we'll just call that L over 2, where this is L. So L over 2 is equal to 0.05 meters. All right, so we're going to use L over 2, or 0.05 meters, as our characteristic length, since it's a plain wall. And we're finally dividing by thermal conductivity, which is 48. Plugging all those numbers in, we get 0.26, which is greater than 0.1. Because it is greater, this is not an isothermal piece of material. In other words, our temperature here is hotter and decreases significantly to the center line which means we can't use lumped capacitance. Instead, we're going to have to use a solved heat diffusion equation approach. All right, so we get that out of the book. We're going to start by writing an equation for theta, not star. And I will explain what all of this is in one second. This is supposed to be a zeta, which I can't do, so we're going to make it kind of a squiggly. Okay, theta naught star, which we'll write like this, is equal to T minus T infinity over T initial minus T infinity, where we use the T of the center line. So this naught specifically represents the temperature of our center line. In other words, what we are looking for. So plugging in the value we want, 550 here, and our T infinity, 800 here, our T initial, 200 here, and again, T infinity, 800, we get a theta naught star of 0.417. Now, so we've defined this. We also need to figure out what the Fourier number is. So the Fourier number is defined as our thermal diffusivity times time divided by our characteristic length squared. So we actually can't compute this yet because it has what we're looking for, t. Instead, we're going to solve this equation right here for the Fourier number. But we still need c1 and our zeta. Well, we're going to look those up in table 5.1, and they are a function simply of the BO number. So I've looked those up already. C1 is 1.0396. We had to do a little interpolating of our table. And then our zeta term is equal to 0 0.488. And I should be accurate. This is actually a zeta 1. In reality, this solution would have an infinite series, but we are approximating using only the first term because our Fourier number we're assuming, and so we've now made an assumption, assuming that our Fourier number is greater than 0.2. So we're going to have to check that. OK, so we have our zeta, we have c, we have theta naught. We don't know Fourier, but we're going to plug it all into here and solve for it. So we're going to rearrange a little bit and say the natural log of theta naught star divided by oh, I'm sorry, not theta, C1, is equal to minus zeta squared times the Fourier number. So I've just rearranged this equation by dividing by C1, taking the natural log of both sides. OK, I'm not going to go through all of this math, but when we solve this equation, you see now we can do this calculation, and we could even move this over here, leaving just the Fourier number, which again, given right here, has t inside of it. So solving this entire equation for t, 
we get a time of 861 seconds. Okay. Now, uh, as a discussion point, I'll just talk about this. In this, um, in this approach, you notice that we neglected radiation. We said, well, uh, we only have convection. However, at a temperature of 550 degrees C, that's the center line. We don't know what the surface temperature is. We could find it. I'm sure it's significant. Radiation heat transfer would be substantial. But in this case, what that would do is have additional heat leaving. We'd have convection and radiation, which means it would take less time in order to get to our final temperature. I'm sorry, that would not be leaving. It would be heat coming in. So it would take less time to heat our surface to this temperature. So this is a conservative estimate by neglecting radiation. Okay, that is our second practice problem. Thanks for watching.